Well, this morning we are concluding our series on distinctly Christian relationships, and we're talking about toxic people, toxic people in our lives. And uh, I think this is going to be some new stuff for some of us on how we apply our faith to some of these toxic people in our lives. Now, we've started every sermon talking about some fundamental truths about our faith. And the first is that that every human being is created in the image of God. And what that means is every human life has intrinsic value. No matter mental capacity, physical capacity, everyone is treasured by God. And this includes toxic people. The people that hurt us, they too are beloved by God. And that's a perspective that we have to keep throughout this whole discussion. It's also true that uh, those who call Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior are called part of the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And one of the unfortunate truths is that uh, toxicity in relationships uh, because of sin, it happens even inside the church. It happens even amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. uh, That just because we've been redeemed by Jesus doesn't mean that sometimes these things don't impact our relationships with each other. We also mentioned that every single relationship has been impacted by sin. We bring it into our, our marriages, we bring it into relationships with, with siblings, uh, with coworkers, church members. Uh, every relationship we have is impacted by this sin. And it's important for us to just for a second pause and, sit and understand how God views sin. You see, God views sin as something that is toxic. I think that's an analogy that we could probably use, that God views sin as toxic. Now, a lot of times when we think of sin, we're going, well, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we could just do something to cover it up, right? You know, if we do enough good things, or maybe we can dilute the bad things with the, enough good things and get it close enough to where kind of, kind of good, or, or maybe we can cover it up with enough good things over top of the bad things. But I think that's analogous to like trying to clean your house just by spraying everything with Febreze, right? You know, this doesn't really deal with all the problems that are there, right? There's still fundamental things that are there. And the reason I think God views sin as toxic is because of its nature. It's destructive. It brings death wherever it goes. And it's not one of those things that can be washed away with anything else except the blood of Jesus. It's the only thing that can cleanse the toxicity of sin. And when you think about it, when you have a holy God that is perfect and righteous and clean and pure, and you have toxicity of sin, God says, I I don't want that around me. I find that utterly disgusting. It's destructive. It's gross. It has no place with me. And that's actually, apart from Jesus, part of what we look like because of the toxicity of sin. But it's because of Jesus Christ. When he said on the cross, he said, I want to take all of that toxicity I want, to, I want to draw it to myself, all of its consequences, all of, all, all of the eternal consequences as what God views that stuff is deserving of. I want to take it to myself, and I want to take it to the grave. And I want you to receive a cleansing and a new righteousness, a purity that is not your own. It's something given to you. It's imparted to you. So that's what I want you to have, that kind of a cleansing. And we say that can only come through Jesus Christ. Now, that, those truths are fundamental as we talk about dealing with toxic people. Now, we all have toxic people in our lives. And when we say toxic people, we don't mean uh, the people that have an occasional bad day and do something that hurts us. Uh, That happens. That's part of relationships with sinful people. What we're talking about is a pattern of long-term things that really are just destructive to the person that's doing it, to the people that it's having that done to them. It just, instead of giving life, it brings death. In fact, you know toxic people because they're the kind of people that suck the life right out of you, right? We all have people like this. And sometimes we're not even conscious of it, but we just try to pull back and even limit our time or avoid people because they're just 
they're, they're, we feel so drained after being like them. There's sometimes they discourage us so much uh, that we say, we just instinctively want to limit the amount of exposure to them because of that toxicity. And one of the things we want to look at today is how does the Bible talk about interactions with people like that? And I think it's important to, uh, to always start with Jesus. Let's read this verse together. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Now, in church, we talk about like the innocent and doves part all the time. Today, we're going to talk about some of the shrewd as snake stuff too. And what, what does that actually mean as we interact with toxic people? And how do we love them and respond to them in a way that is distinctly Christian as opposed to the way that our culture and our world around us says that we should deal with people who are toxic? If you're following along in your sermon notes, this is the first of our fill in the blanks. And this is really key for us to acknowledge that when we let toxic people hurt us or others, it is neither Christ-like nor loving. Sometimes in the church, we get a mistaken idea that our calling is to be doormats for other people, that this is part of what Jesus meant by just turning the other cheek. It means that people can uh, sin against you and, and do all those kind of things and never have to face any consequences for it. But let's reframe that. Let's relook at that idea for just a moment. Remember a few weeks ago when we talked about marriage, we said that, that marriage uh, is essentially a ministry of one spouse to another. Marriage is first and foremost a ministry where, the, where the, each spouse is trying to help the other person become more and more the person God's created them to be. That's, that's part of the role uh, of, of marriage. But I think that same truth applies to other relationships as well. One of the things that we're hoping to do with, with the other people around us is to minister to them, to help them become more and more the, the, the man or the woman that God's called them to be. And so when someone has a toxic behavior and begins to hurt the people around them, maybe you, maybe, some, maybe other people that you love, to let them go on doing that is not good for anybody. It's really easy to see, you know, we see the hurt and the pieces that come from how they've hurt other people. But think about from their perspective for just a minute. Is that doing good things for them spiritually? Not at all, right? In fact, the more that, that we allow another person to sin, it actually sends them further and further down a road that is not healthy at all. And so one of the things that we want to figure out, how do, we, how do we do this in a Christ-like way? How do we actually confront evil? How do, we, how do we call people on those kinds of things in a way that's loving and, and healthy and, and helpful? And so we're going to look at that as we go on this morning. Now, before we get to how Jesus responded to people that were toxic, um, we want to just identify five traits that you'll find amongst toxic people. This is not an exhaustive list. There are lots of traits, but these are five very common ones. And one of the first ones you'll find is legalism. Or you might even say like nitpicking, right? Now, people who are toxic like rules. And they, like, uh, they almost treat relationships like contracts. In fact, uh, if, you, if you break the agreement, break the rules, uh, they'll let you know. In fact, they've probably got a list for you, right? Let me, let me tell you all the times you've broken the rules. And let me bring this up again and again and again. And because it, it's part of that legalism and, and having other people br break the rules that allows them to... Um, to, to feel better about themselves by saying, here's where you're wrong. Here's where you have broken down. Uh, here, here's where you're not doing things the right way. What's interesting to me about this is this is the exact opposite of what Christianity is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be something that's known first and foremost by grace, right? That yes, God does have uh, laws that we're called to follow, absolutely. Absolutely. However, the over, overarching aspect of Christianity is always grace. And the thing that, that, that pains me is to know that the world around us probably sees Christians more as legalistic than people who are full of grace. We're known more by those things, and something's gone wrong when that happens. 
And if you wanted to find a picture of what, what does legalism look like? Well, it's the church lady from Saturday Night Live, right? You've, if you've seen that show, if you've seen that. That's, that's the epitome of legalism right there. And so we're called to be grace-filled. The second thing is guilt trips. This is where someone will try to shift the blame for some of their mess onto you. And it will look something like this. I wouldn't have gotten so angry if you didn't. I wouldn't drink so much if you would start doing. The reason I do this is because you always. And what's going on here is that the person is trying to shift the blame for their bad behavior. They're trying to say, um, you're the one that's responsible for me acting this way. And friends, that's never right. And we'll talk about how to deal with that shortly. Another thing that you'll find a trait amongst toxic people is maligning motives, right? They, they, they assign you bad motives for why you're doing something. They'll say, well, you're just doing this because you want to control me. Or you're doing this because you want my job. Or you're doing this because you want to take all my fun away. Or there, there are all kinds of ways that this shows up. Now, has anyone ever had that happen to you? Someone accused you of, of wrong motives? Yeah, right, we have. That's incredibly painful, isn't it? Incredibly painful. And, and this is something that we continually find toxic people doing over time. They're always saying you have the wrong, you have evil, wrong motivations behind what you are doing. In fact, this is the opposite of one of the commandments, the eighth commandment. Do not slander. In fact, Luther, when he goes on to explain what that means, he says we're, we're to actually speak well of people and put the best construction on everything. Right? That's the exact opposite of this. It's life-giving rather than life-taking. Another trait you'll find is intimidation. Oftentimes, toxic people will try to get their way, will try to control people and environments by intimidating people. They'll say things like, if you don't uh, do this, don't bother coming into work on Monday morning. If you won't start doing this, I may just have to leave. There's all kinds of ways that this comes up in relationships. They try to get their way through intimidation. Now, when someone is intimidating you and they're trying to do this, what kind of good conversations do you actually have? What kind of constructive dialogue happens when someone is trying to intimidate another person? It's about zero, right? It's, it's awfully hard to have constructive dialogue or to move forward in any way if someone is trying to intimidate the other person because they're trying to control them and, and get, get the outcome that they want by forcing their will on someone else. This, too, is a toxic trait. And the fifth thing is ridicule. And this can be ridiculing a person's dreams, their hopes, their aspirations. It can be ridiculing their abilities, their performance on something. It can, eat, it can even be ridiculing them because they're trying to live out their faith. If someone who says, hey, I, I, I'm, I take this thing of, of trying to follow Jesus seriously, I want to do it. And there could be people that ridicule you for trying to be the man or woman God's called you to be. And ridicule is incredibly toxic. There's a man by the name of John Gottman. And, and he, he was able to predict with a 90% uh, accuracy whether or not couples would stay married or not. And his main factor he used was whether or not they ridiculed one another. His belief was that when, when it gets to that point in a relationship, it's awfully hard to fix and repair. It's ridicule. It's so destructive to us. It is the exact opposite of speaking life into people, of encouraging people. It's ridicule. And as we mentioned, these are just five of many traits that toxic people have. And I suspect that as we talked about some of these, there might have been images of people that flashed in your mind. You go, yeah, I know somebody like that. I've been on the receiving end of that kind of thing. We get this. So how do we respond? Well, 
part of our calling as disciples is to live like Jesus. And the goal of each one of us is to not only know what Jesus, our teacher, knew. We want to imitate him. We want to become like him. And so the most helpful thing for us to do in a situation like this is to look at Jesus and say, what did he do when he ran into toxic people? And so we're going to look at a couple of instances in Jesus' life and some of his patterns on how he responded to toxic people. One of the first things we realize about Jesus is that when he encountered, he knew there was his part, the Father's part, and their part. And here's what we mean by that. Jesus knew that there were things that he can do. He could call people to follow him. He could teach them. There, there, was, there were a lot of things that he could do. But he couldn't do their part for them. He couldn't change their heart. He couldn't make them believe. That's not how God operates. And we, he also knew that the Father was very reliable. The Father was always going to do his part too and do only the things that he could do. But the Father believes so much in free will. He loves people so much that he, he, he never forces himself on them. He never makes them choose him. He never makes them choose his ways over their own ways or sinful ways. God doesn't work that way. He chooses not to. He respects free will. And so there's always the other person's part. And what, what this would mean is every encounter with Jesus, every time he'd come, come across somebody and, and they, would, they would act in a way that was toxic and try to hurt him, um, even when Jesus does everything right, they can still respond in a poor way. Remember that there, there was a, a rich young man that was invited to follow Jesus just like the other 12, but he walked away. He walked away because he loved something else more than Jesus. There was always his choice, his part. And one of the, the Bible passages that's very instructive on this is, is from Romans chapter 12. Let's read that together. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And what that implies is that even if you do everything right, it might not work out because of the other person's responsibilities and their choices. But one of the things that we can do is to pray for people. Let's read this verse together. You have heard it that it was said, love your enemy and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We're called to pray for them. That is our part. That's what we can do. And Part of what can happen in prayer is not just that God would move and shake things up in someone else's life, but a lot of times God works in us to give us a new perspective and change our hearts as well. And that's, that's a critical part of prayer. That's part of our part and God's part. A second thing that we see Jesus doing when he encountered toxic people is he had boundaries and he was willing to withdraw himself when needed. He was willing to withdraw himself when needed. There's a couple of different times in Scripture where he pulls himself out of a situation. Now, you, I thought Jesus came to die for the sins of people, right? So what's he doing here? Well, notice when Jesus talks about dying, he says, I lay my life down of my own accord. No one takes it from me. It was on the Father's timetable. It wasn't on man's. And Jesus knew that when there were people that were bent on doing things that were destructive and hurtful, that, that it was perfectly right and good to extract himself from that situation. That he didn't have to just take the abuse and let them continue on sinning and, and damaging their own spiritual life as well as having him on the receiving end of that. Jesus with, withdrew himself. He had boundaries. In fact, here's, here's one of those times, right? The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, he withdrew from that place. Jesus would do that. Now, for us, what would this look like? Well, sometimes when we have relationships, oftentimes with people that we love, 
uh, maybe even family members. We get in a conversation or a phone call, and you can tell it's kind of spiraling downhill, and sooner or later, somebody's going to hang up on the other person. Right? Some of us have those kind of relationships in our lives. And a lot of times, it, you know, it turns into a yelling match or, or all kinds of things, and you, and you go, yeah, this, this is ugly, this is bad. Well, friends, we can actually change that pattern. We don't have to do it that way. And one of the things that we can do is, is when, when a conversation starts going that way, when it starts going south, and you, you can kind of tell because there's a predictable nature to this thing, you say, well, um, you know, I, I'm seeing that, that this conversation is not going anywhere good. And what I'd like to do, I think I'm, I think I'm going to um, end this call, and when we both feel like we can continue this conversation in a constructive way, why don't we pick it up where we left off? And we can do that. That's a very assertive and loving kind of way to do that. That's a lot better than hanging up on people and calling them names. But when you start to sense a pattern going in a wrong direction, you can call a halt to it. You can put up your boundaries. You don't have to take the abuse from other people. You don't have to live as a doormat. Because as we mentioned, that's not doing you any favors. It's not doing them any favors when we allow that to happen. And whether it's on the phone, whether it's in person, in a marriage, or with siblings or friends, there are things that we can do to say, hey, we're going to just pause this conversation and we're going to come back at it uh, and when, when it's time to do that. And there are times where we have to actually extract ourselves for a, for, a, for a season from a relationship when it's unhealthy because sometimes people need to experience the consequences of their actions. One of the things that, that happens a lot is something we call enabling. So what happens is, is one, one person in a relationship has these toxic, maybe abusive behaviors, and there's another person that sort of accepts the blame, accepts the guilt, or even covers up for the other person. And you know what? It actually takes both people to make that work. Right? It takes one person to be toxic and the other person to take it. And, but if either of those two things is removed from the equation, it, it doesn't work anymore. That, that downhill spiral stops going on. And so all of a sudden, if, if we found ourselves that we, you know, we've, been, we've been kind of enabling people before, we've, we've been allowing those bad behaviors to happen, and we, and we say, you know what, I'm not going to play that game anymore. I'm going to shift things up a little bit. We, we actually um, take the wind out of people's sails. We, we stop fueling the fire, and, and we can actually have some good dialogue that can come with that when we do those things. Wrong button. The third thing that Jesus did was he didn't feel a need to play their game. In fact, sometimes he would change the game. So Jesus continually frustrates the Pharisees, right? They're always coming up to him, okay, Jesus, pick this or this. Which one is it? He goes, neither. And like, oh! <laughs> They're always mad at him because he's not playing along. He's not going the way that he wants them to go. He just doesn't play their game. And, and one of the times when this happens, right, it says the Pharisees went and laid plans to trap him in his words. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Now, do you think that Jesus was naive about the hearts of men and, and he would go around, wait a second, are you trying to... No, that probably didn't happen, right? He knew from the beginning that there were, she, there were wolves in sheep's clothing, weren't there? There were people out there that were trying to trap him and to hurt other people. He knew this wasn't a surprise to him. And so he knew how to, to change up the game. He didn't feel like he had to, to go on doing that. And just think about this too. Anytime you get in an argument, uh, uh, people usually want you to play their game. In fact, they're, they're going to start off uh, and maybe, maybe they'll throw an insult at you or disrespect you. And in order to keep things going, they need you to do it back to them. Right? They, they need you to do that because if you, you have to play into the game, but if you stop playing the game, it just, well, it changes everything up. It changes everything. In fact, uh, one of the, the passages in Scripture that deals with this is, is this. Let's read it together. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
when you change the game, right, when you change the pattern of someone's uh, destructive and toxic behaviors and, and they're kind of expecting you to throw the same thing back at them and, and all of a sudden you, you overcome evil with good, when, when you show love back to them instead of what, what seems like it should be fair and just and right, but you show grace and love and mercy, you just take the wind out of the sails. You stop feeding the fire. And you can change the game in significant ways. There's some good news about toxic people and their dysfunctional behaviors. I'm going to tell you a story and draw some uh, applications from it. So I was a, a brand new pastor, two months out of seminary, and I was at uh, my first church, and we had our first voters' assembly. And uh, I think that the church leadership had some plans and they were kind of moving forward, good things about doing stuff. And all of a sudden, there was a person that got up, a, a toxic person in the congregation, mind you. And all of a sudden, they started derailing everything that the rest of the congregation wanted. I mean, this one person sort of like took the rest of the congregation hostage uh, with some poor behavior and, and whining and complaining and, and all kinds of stuff. And... And I remember just watching that going, what just happened here? This, what, what, how would this happen? And, and so everything got derailed at that voters' assembly. And so I, I called up a mentor of mine, and I, I just explained to him. I said, this, here's what happened or whatever, and he, he gave me some advice. And, well, in this congregation, we had a voters' assembly every six months. And so uh, the next time when things came around, uh, this gentleman, once again, same behavior. By the way, I found out this has been going on for years, uh, by the way. And, and so uh, he comes up and, and starts to go down the same path again, saying, you know, well, we've got we to gotta worry about this. We've got to be afraid of that. This, this could happen. This might happen. Uh, I got up and I said, Jim, you know, th those are valid concerns. But you know what? Uh, I don't think that that's actually probably going to happen. So why don't we continue going on down the path that the congregation has decided they want to go? And if those, those, are, those concerns prove to be valid, we'll go back to that and we'll revisit that. And the congregation was kind of like, we can do that, <laughs> right? We can, uh, and, and so all of a sudden, the, the toxicity that had held this congregation captive was, was removed, it was freed. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. Typically, toxic people follow a predictable pattern. As I mentioned, this had been going on for years, right? It's been going on for years, and anything that is predictable is also, you can also anticipate, right? You, you know, okay, this is probably going to happen again. And anything that can be anticipated and predicted, you can also make a plan to change. This is why I bring this up. In our toxic relationships with people, there are, most of the time, they follow very predictable patterns. And, and for most of us, we go, oh, no, here it comes again, right? That, that it's, there's kind of that feeling of dread. We know where this is going to go. And, friends, that's one response. But you can have a different response. And you can go, you know what? I know exactly where this is going. I'm anticipating where this is going to go. And now we can change the game. We can change the response. I know they're actually expecting this response from me. I know they need this response in order to keep their line of thinking going. And if all of a sudden we don't play along, if all of a sudden we change the game, you take the wind out of the sails. Friends, one of the reasons why small groups are so important is that we actually deal with this kind of stuff. In fact, this last Sunday, the group that meets at my house, we were dealing with this very same kind of an issue. And one of the things I love about small groups is that you have other believers around you, people that have studied God's word, who are intent on God's best for you and, and the whole group there, and, and they will help us. Because one of the dangers that happens uh, when these predictable patterns sort of take place in our lives is if they've been going on for a long time, we can't imagine anything different. We get stuck. We get bl like blinders on and we can't see how things can change. And when there are other men and women who love God and know God's word in our lives, they can help speak into our lives in ways that help us at this time. They'll be there and support us in the midst of this. Friends, this, this is why we need one another. It's, it's why the, the fellowship of believers is so important. 
But we also have a group that deals specifically with the problem of enabling. Now, typically when we think about recovery groups, right, Celebrate Recovery, and by the way, this is our ministry that's, that's a, it's, it's like a, it's a 12-step program, but it's, it's distinctly Christian, Christ-based. And, and we think typically, okay, well, this is for people with, with hurts and habits and hang-ups and, and all kinds of, uh, like, drug addictions and alcohol addictions and gambling and that kind of stuff. Well, yes, they, they do help with that. But there's also a whole other aspect of enabling other people. That's when you and I allow someone else to be toxic. When over time, uh, we're, we're the other half that's allowing the bad behavior to happen. There's a whole group that's, that's, that's for those kinds of people. In fact, if you walk out of here this morning, they have a table set up in the back, and they've got a sheet just on enabling and what that looks like and how you can change the pattern. There's people that want to walk with you and help you figure out how could things be different? What would it look like to do this in a way that's distinctly Christian and loving towards the people around us? Also, if, if you're interested and you want to just pursue some books, these are a couple of books that can be incredibly helpful in that area. One is called Boundaries. It's by Dr. Cloud and Dr. Townsend. They are Christian psychologists. Uh, have a whole bunch of good stuff. In fact, there's actually a, a website, cloudtownsend.com, uh, where they've got a bunch of answers, like three to five minute answers on, on video from all kinds of relationship dysfunctions that go on, cloudtownsend.com, from a Christian perspective. And it's, it's incredibly helpful if we're struggling with some of these things and how to deal with that. Another book is Speaking the Truth in Love. This book is actually used as part of our Stephen ministry training. And it's, it's on how to be an assertive Christian. And sometimes people think that you only have two options. You can be aggressive or you can be passive. But neither of those is a biblical response. It's assertiveness of saying, here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Uh, how, how do you become that kind of a person? It's a great book uh, in that regard. A couple of resources for you to, to pursue with that. A key question for us is, is there any hope for the toxic person? This is important because a lot of times toxic people are the people that are close to us. A lot of times they're family members. You don't just throw away those kind of relationships. At the same time, you go, it can't continue this way. Is there any hope for toxic people? Well, as we mentioned before, there's your part, there's God's part, there's their part. And friends, what, what toxic people need is the same thing that you and I need. They, they need the transforming power of the gospel. They need the blood of Jesus to come and wash them. And one of the things that we believe as followers of Jesus is that the gospel is not just for eternity. It's not just about what's going to happen after you die. The gospel is something that can set a new trajectory for your life today. That when we see our sin, when we see the harm that it's done to other people and it begins to grieve us and we cry out to God and say, God, change me. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. God answers that prayer. God hears the cry of that person and says, I'll, I'll work in your life. I can take you and I can make you clean and I can make you new. And so there's hope for a toxic person just like there's hope for any of us. That's where it lies, friends. My hope for you is if you find that maybe you're a person that's been putting toxic things into other people's lives, is that you'll recognize that. You'll see some of the pain that it's caused and you'll say, you know what? That's not the legacy I want to leave. That's not how I want to be remembered by. I want to be remembered as someone who's life-giving, not life-draining and taking. Father, I want you to change me. I want to lay my heart before you. I want you to come in and cleanse me and make me into a new man or a new woman. That, that's what your prayer needs to be. But if you're the person that's been living with this and even been allowing it and enabling it to happen, the prayer for you needs to be one for courage. To say, you know, Father, I recognize now that this is not doing them any favors. This is not being a loving person by letting these behaviors continue. In fact, we're, I'm, I'm enabling them to go down a dark path. 
I'm enabling them to go down a way that's destructive to, to me, to our families, to our relationships around us. And so, Father, give me the courage to change. Give me the people around me that can help me do that. that friends, that needs to be your prayer. And my hope for you, friends, is that you'll live this out as distinctly Christian people with distinctly Christian relationships that we learn how to really love the toxic people in our lives and help them in a way that points them to Jesus. Let me pray for you. Father, this is a tough message. And Father, it hits home for a lot of us. Lord, would you uh, give us whatever's needed? The ability to change ourselves Father, if we're the toxic person, Lord, that's not what we want. Change us. If we're enabling people, Lord, that's just not a healthy pattern either. So, Father, change that too. And, Lord, for the people around us uh, that, that we see that are in the midst of some of these, Lord, give us the courage to speak up, to speak life into them, to support the people that are trying to change. And Father, we just pray that we might walk in the way of wisdom, that we might do right, that we might live as people who are wise as serpents, innocent as doves. In the name of Jesus, amen.